Two titles, because I couldn't figure out what to talk about. Um, and the first one is very provocative, so basically saying, you know, all this is worthless, you don't need data scientists, right? Um, no, not exactly. Um, this is going to be about two broad trends. Um, I've been working in the field of big data, I guess you can call it a field now, uh, for about five years, which makes me a dinosaur, actually, in the space. Um, and I've noticed two very um, interesting broad-based trends, and the whole time I've been working for this software company here, which is Datamere. Um, one is the skills gap. So data scientists are a hot commodity. It's created enormous uh, economic potential for individuals who want to sell themselves as a data scientist. Um, and, uh, and the other one is, um, and, and there's, a, there's a drastically uh, more data science jobs than, than there is supply. So demand is outstripping supply, uh, very much so. And then the second is there's sort of um, sea change, I would call it, from an older technology stack, you guys have learned a bit about the stack um, in this course, to a, a newer technology stack. Uh, which I would say a sort of big data native technology stack. And so as that sea change has occurred sort of in waves, you know, there's lots of um, other uh, disruptions that that creates, moving data between the two environments and uh, creating an ecosystem, opening kind of a, a space in the market for companies to build on top of that new platform. And if you're familiar at all with sort of business computing, there was mainframes, you know, back in the day, and then there was client server, which gave us windows and databases and all that. And then now there's this big data cloud sort of centric world of building applications. Um, so the talk is kind of going to talk about those two, um, those two uh, observations. Um, okay, so um, a little bit about me. Um, first principles uh, for data scientists, data science that we want to maintain, even if we're not only uh, using scientists to do data science. Mind-blowing fun fact. Current state of the uh, market and challenges, or current state of the technology and challenges. Suggestions for making life easier. And then we get into the technology bit, right? Why the technology, why the architecture of the technology matters. I know you guys aren't all um, techies in here. Um, I'll try to keep it at, at a reasonable level, level for MBA students. Um, and then uh, a bit about the, the industry of big data or the, the, the sector of big data, whatever you want to call it. I didn't go to business school, so I don't know the right term, but um, you know, what kind of companies are being created, um, money's being invested in the space, and how that's affecting uh, some of the incumbents, um, commoditization, and so forth. Um, so I'm an enterprise infrastructure software guy, so basically built plumbing, um, uh, worked for a number of companies over the last uh, 15 years, uh, focusing on abstractions and customers. In other words, I was serving customers, so out on the front lines, talking to customers, selling them on the product, uh, helping them understand it. And then also uh, the software I was building was trying to sort of make things 10 times or 100 times easier. So putting layers of abstraction on top of low level plumbing um, to make it, make allow people to be more productive and more people to use it. I was briefly, briefly Greg's webmaster um, for some little venture he had back in the dot com day. You can uh, ask him about it later. Uh, we didn't quite get off the ground, but um, no, I just uh, ran into Greg through a mutual friend and um, totally randomly reconnected for this, uh, this opportunity, so interesting. I like simplicity. Um, so favorite example in building all this plumbing was um, when I was in the previous, one of the previous companies, BEA, we had this complex, what we called middleware, which is basically plumbing, right, to connect different databases and applications and systems. And um, you could do a lot of powerful things if you, um, just made it look simple. And so um, there's this feature that does all that and talks about message-driven beans and middleware and uh, the Java web service and all this technical gobbledygook. But the feature was exposed as a checkbox. So somebody from Microsoft came in and said, we made development easy at Microsoft. They're, they're all about user experience, right? They're the kings of that. And they said, we're going to take all this plumbing and we're going to make it super easy. And we're just going to put a little indication in our um, our development tool, right, that looks like that. So you check a box, this little thing would show up and say, oh, there's a buffer in between, and it would do all of that, right? So elegantly simple, um, you know, functionality um, to make it more accessible and, and demystified and, and so forth. And I think that um, data science as a field needs more of that. Um, but first, um, what is uh, innate about data science that we don't want to change, right? And I think a great example of this comes from um, one of the uh, great pioneers of the data science, kind of coined the term, early employee at Facebook named Jeff Hammerbacher. Probably heard of him, a lot of you. Um, and he made a lot of, he said a lot of first principles that were interesting. I think he, he was responsible for really establishing a data culture in a new company. So a team, you know, tools, methods around data science very early uh, in the term's life. And um, so these are the rules. 
instrument everything. So that means basically capture everything, right? If someone buys something for you, capture that, duh, right? But if someone clicks something on their device, if someone scrolls, right? If some uh, system has a problem, uh, if a sensor uh, has a reading, capture every single tiny little increment of data, tiny little piece of data that you can because you might need it and it might give you some interesting information, maybe later, maybe not right away. Invest in infrastructure. Uh, to be able to capture and meaningfully use that data, you need gear, you need horsepower, right? You need to make investments in infrastructure. Um, and then put all your data in one place. So we had um, automating of business transactions through databases and other technologies in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, but they were all in what we call silos, so they all couldn't talk to each other, right? They didn't speak the same language, and uh, if you had to understand what happened in both places, you couldn't, or you had to put it all together into one place, and even that process was very arduous. Now it's a lot simpler, but if you have everything in one place, you can ask sweeping questions across all the different pieces of data. And um, bring, bring in the data first and ask the questions later, because if you presume the questions, you presume what data is important, you presume the types of questions people are going to have, you're going to miss something, right? If the data is there, the data is the ultimate form of truth. See what the data tells you, right? It's a little out there, but it helps. Um, keep the raw data forever because you never know uh, when you might need it. Um, you might need to go back and say, you know, what happened over the, the Santa Claus rally, you know, 25 years ago, if I'm in um, the capital markets or, you know, uh, Black Friday. Uh, we'd like to look at the performance on Black Friday as a retailer 30 years in a row. Uh, you need to be able to store 30 years worth of data because you didn't know you might ask that question. Um, and then let everyone party on the data. So this is sort of a democratizing access to the data. Like, let everybody. Uh, get to the data easily, lower the barrier to entry, right? Um, make it comfortable for them to use the data and they will rise to the occasion. They will show you their creativity and they will get more experimental and they will try and fail more if you uh, make it uh, available. And then provide tools to support the whole life cycle um, end to end. And I kind of tweaked that one a bit because it's self-serving to me. Okay, so mind-boggling fun fact, you guys are all in this course. Um, McKinsey said uh, about a year ago, there's uh, 190,000 unfilled data scientist jobs by 2018, right? So enormous amount of opportunity um, to come and fill that gap. Um, again, um, you know, d demand is clearly outstripping supply. Um, the other fun fact is that what I would call the signal to noise ratio is dropping. So in other words, the percentage of data that's relevant is going down as more and more junk gets generated, right? like all your Facebook messages, no, not really your Facebook messages, but like all the, the sensor data that's being captured, like you walked in the room and temperature was this and whatnot, it may not be important, it may be important, you may not know it's important for years, but you wanna keep it, just in case. Um, and um, you know, there's, there's just an enormous amount of data because people have realized we should collect it in case we need it, and so volume's going up, um, number of people who actually can analyze it is the same, um, so you got to be able to extract the signal from the noise, right? You got to be able to find the patterns. Um, and so you need to apply a lot of uh, data science to the data uh, one way or another in order to get those insights uh, out of an extremely uh, noisy data set. Current state with data science, um, if you look at the traditional approach to what uh, one would call uh, advanced analytics or predictive analytics, uh, and, and also, to some extent, the data science practice in, in the new world is that there was a lot of very esoteric skills, right? You needed to know very specific technology, be trained for a long time, and um, you'd try something, you'd wait quite a while before you'd get a measurement and be able to refine your analysis. Um, it, was very, it was not very transparent, it was very opaque. If you weren't sort of in that office, in that corner of the company, you didn't know about the technology. Uh, that allowed you to do prediction, right, or allowed you to do data mining or whatever that was. Um, the data was uh, spread all over the place in these isolated silos, as I mentioned. Um, and then um, the data was very dirty, the data was very noisy, and you had to do a lot of work to sort of wash that data, clean it up, transform it into something valuable, right, to sort of mold that data into what you want. Um, and that took a lot of, t wasted a lot of people's time. Um, because you didn't have that much computing power at your fingertips, right, you had to basically take a small sample of the data and do this experiment in a petri dish on 1% of your data and hope that that result translated to the rest of the population of data, right, downsampling. Um, you had to backtest on small amounts of historical data, which is basically guesstimation. And it's very expensive, right? The technologies were very expensive, uh, the software and the hardware. And, um, but on the flip side of that, 
the work product of a scientist or a statistician or someone who's in predictive analytics or operations research, all these terms are used um, sometimes interchangeably, even though they're not, um, they, this is very valuable. So they're building this very, very valuable work product, but with all of those issues, right? So there's a lot of room for improvement. And so um, the recipe for sort of um, cycling through this, iter iterating through data analytics was pull some historical data to extract a small sample of that, uh, cleanse that data in your Petri dish of uh, your tool, and you guys use Python and stuff like that. You, use, you could be using R, you could be using uh, SAS, um, commercial uh, predictive analytics tool. Uh, you would then design and implement a model um, that tells you something about that data, that discovers a pattern or predicts something uh, in the future based on historical trends. And then you would train your model, so you would tune the model to the sample of data that you had. Um, then because that environment was so specialized, if you actually wanted to operationalize that and make it actually affect the business, you would take that model as a data scientist, explain it to a software developer, a software developer would take that and say, hmm, how does that work in C++ or Java? And then they would rebuild the entire thing over again in code. And then they'd go through testing cycles before it ever got into production. And then you could get some feedback, right? So all that communication, all those steps, um, the deployment process of the software development life cycle, um, and things change frequently. And you often get your analysis wrong based on the sample of the data, so very painful. The point is that businesses are making everyday decisions with data. So some of this is very complicated, um, you know, portfolio optimization, and some of it is, is rather simple. It's like, let's look at the application logs and see what people are doing on Uber, and let's combine that with how much they spend, which is in a database, right? And let's see the trend over time. Like, it's not that complicated. The math is extremely simple, right? But yet, a lot of data scientists uh, are using this approach um, to, to accomplish those tests, answer those simple business questions, and we don't, want, we don't like that. There must be a better way. Um, so how do you, how do you uh, go, take a step further? How do you take a giant leap? Uh, you have a lot of tools in the market um, for traditional data analytics. And when I say traditional analytics, data analytics, I mean smaller data sets. I mean what we call structured data, sort of rows and columns, kind of rectangular data sets. And I'm talking about um, really um, uh, not machine generated data, but usually like transactions, a customer profile, um, something like that. It's very straightforward and doesn't have a lot of uh, complicated behavioral data in it. And so there's multiple different tools to be able to get uh, value out of this data, um, but they all have a variety of drawbacks. So you've got the legacy tools, which don't really scale to the volumes of data people have today. Um, they're very expensive and they sit in their own little world because you have to translate to the developer. Then you have development-driven sort of approach with uh, data statistics uh, tools like R. Um, you have to code, obviously, so you have to be a developer to use it. If you're answering a business question, but you're a developer. And when you actually want to try to run those um, in a big data environment, right? One of those big data environments is called Hadoop. It's very clunky. And then you have other tools that are now being created just specifically for big data, but they're not very mature. And so uh, on top of all of that, right? You're starting to get really depressed, right? Uh, what about the rest of the story? Like just not the, not the advanced analytics, but what about the rest of it, right? So it's not just um, uh, predictive analytics. It's not just data visualization, right? It's not just machine learning. Um, it's not just Hadoop. Um, it's not just trying to re-implement data warehousing. It's a complex uh, workflow or life cycle around data. So whatever it takes to get a granular, complete, and up-to-date understanding of what's happening in your business, right? Every single thing that's happening down to the click level or the um, button level on the application. Um, and it's answering questions at the speed of business. So what does that mean? The business wants to understand how they should, uh, should steer the ship. They get an answer in time to be able to steer the ship, right? When they have a competitive threat or when um, they're spending too much money somewhere, right? Or when they need to acquire new customers um, in order to you know, avoid a competitor. And uh, it can't be slower than that because then you, you run into the iceberg, right? Relevancy in all customer interactions. So when you're pushing um, an ad or you're pushing a, an email, you're pushing content to a website, you're pushing um, some message to somebody, it should be as relevant as possible to them, like down to the smallest segment of customers. You know, the politicians try to do this um, very well. They spend a lot of money and do a lot of creepy things to get you to vote the way they want you to vote because they try to target down to the zip code or down to the individual household. Um, 
And uh, finally, closed loop decisioning that's data driven. So what that means is I can uh, get that data, I can clean it up, I can define my analysis, I can run it and get some result, and then I can take that result and then feed that back into my business operations in a smooth way and keep that cycle going. So I say, ah, it was slightly different, so I need this data now, and I'll ask another question that's related, and I'll go through that cycle again, or I'll just fine tune my model according to what I'm seeing in the business, and can I cycle these things quickly? Like, we got a customer, um, uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they have uh, predictive models that um, make trades, obviously automate uh, trades, algorithmic trading, and, uh, and they actually want to look at what's happening intraday, right? And they want to look at uh, blog posts, and they want to look at Twitter, and they want to look at lots of other data feeds intraday to tune the coefficients that go into their models, right? And update uh, those coefficients uh, every couple of hours in the middle of the day, right? So that they can tune the, the algorithmic trading algorithms within a day. Um, that's closed loop decisioning. And then you need something that can support the whole life cycle. So not just one piece of it, but the end to end life cycle that is uh, working with it with big data. So we look at it as kind of a four step process. Like you need some data, so you need to be able to get that data into your environment. You need to prepare that data so it actually makes sense, it's relevant, it's clean, it's not noisy, it isn't mucking up the whole system. Um, and then you need to define the analysis, visualize the result, deploy that, operationalize that, get some data, some feedback, and then um, start again, right? Tune or just add more data. So the traditional technology that was used for, for, for a lot of these simple questions, right? So you had predictive analytics for the really hard questions, you had what we call data warehousing and business intelligence for the easier questions, right? The people um, like you and me could use a spreadsheet um, would, would ask. And it was very painful. And it was painful because the technology was three different technologies kind of um, bolted together, or glued together in a very restrictive way. So imagine you go through this 18 month process of trying to figure out what data is important to my business. What questions are people going to want to ask? You know, uh, which types of people would ask, what, what data is related to what other data? And then you would basically cast with a mold, a system that you would deploy over an average 18 months uh, with three different technologies you'd buy from three different vendors and they'd all blame the other one when something went wrong, right? And you'd have to call all three people to figure out what went wrong. Um, that's what we would call traditional or schema on write technology. You say up front what data is important and how it should be organized and how it's interrelated. Um, but the problem is the business moves faster than 18 months, right? The business needs questions answered now. They add new data. Um, they, you know, uh, change their applications on a weekly or a monthly cycle now that we have cloud. And they need to adapt to that. And so they can adapt to that with a schema on read approach or an agile analytics approach um, where they can affect changes on a weekly or a monthly basis. And so you just shorten the cycles, right? Especially for those simple questions. Um, and you don't spend as much money because you'd have to spend a lot uh, on human capital and uh, capital expenditure on software in order to do that previously. Um, and so the better way is to make life easier by simplifying, by bringing the technology up a level, uh, lowering the barrier to entry, broadening the base of people who can access the technology, um, and speaking in their language. So speak the language of the business. I'll, I'll say what that means. Don't speak the language of algorithms or the language of technology when you present a tool to a user, right? Generate code, don't write code. Because it's much easier to build something that, that writes code that you know works than let some fool write code that you don't know works. Because when the fool writes code, you gotta test the heck out of it for weeks before you'd ever let it into your uh, production environment. But if you've got a, a product, you can test it a million ways up front. Um, simplify the, the, the data preparation and uh, integration. So if you've got five databases, uh, you've got, um, you, know, you want to get data out of Facebook or Twitter, and you want to get data from a mobile device, you need to be able to quickly pull in that data because you don't want the question to be irrelevant by the time you answer it. You want to be able to um, shape that data and sort of uh, stitch it together so it all makes sense, and we're all measuring the same thing along the same time series um, before that question becomes irrelevant. So you've got to simplify that process. And then you uh, need to be able to, what we call, move the computation to the data. So data is growing, right? You want to put all your data in one place so you can ask these broad sweeping questions. But the data is getting so big that if your analytics tool is over here and over here, you can't forklift that data and move it over to the analytics tool because it'll probably blow up and it'll take too long to move it. Ever try to load like 100 billion rows into Excel? It's not pretty, right? So we go to companies and we look for the smoke coming up from the workstations between the cubicle walls because we think, aha, 
that guy's trying to put too much data in his Excel, right? And his machine's going and he's got the little spinning beach ball, that's our customer, right? So we go after those people. Um, so you need to shift the approach and you need to keep the data where it is and then decide to do some analysis and push that analysis over to where the data is and let the little lawnmower you know, run right over where the grass is. And so the first point about speaking the language of the business, um, if you use sort of the garden variety data science toolkit, right, you will talk about things like CART, K-means, matrix factorization, logistical regression, maybe some people know that one, random forests, random what? Um, mutual information, at least it was mutual. Uh, support vector machine, okay, not even gonna ask. Um, these are the things that actually appear in the, in the toolkits in the drop down menu when you're trying to do some data science. And uh, some of you guys, I know you do your homework in Python, I heard, so you may know all these things already. And you may be experts, <laughs> not all of them. That's the point, right? Not all of them, right? Not everybody can do that. And there's 800 million users of Excel today, right? Why is that, right? Because a lot of people know it already, but also because it's, it's, it's simple and it gives you a lot of freedom. You can create as many different shapes of your data, you can create a pivot table, you can apply your functions formulas, you can annotate what you want, you can visualize it any way you want, and you can, most importantly, you can do it all yourself. You don't have to ask somebody else to do it for you. But smoke starts coming out after you have a certain number of rows, right? So that's the problem. Um, so speak the language by instead of dropping your microphone, um, then just use uh, terms that make sense to the, the business. So these algorithms are the same algorithms that I had in the previous slide. Um, sorry, you can't see it that well, but this is clustering or k-means. Um, what we describe it is find patterns to group your data, right? So we have these three segments of customers and we're gonna put them all in buckets by you know, age, marital status, zip code, and total revenue. Um, and we want four buckets, right? Go, right? So it'll basically correlate the data into the buckets that make the most sense and draw the right lines, right? But if I just told you k-means clustering, right, a lot of people would be like, what? Um, decision trees, this was cart, right? Uh, aut automatically identify the attributes that are, and the likelihood uh, that they lead to a result. So what attributes are most important in determining what the result is and what are the different values that uh, best discriminate amongst those results, right? So I get a lot of people who didn't um, buy here and a lot of people who did buy here when this value was over X, right? And all those different branches, right? It's not that complicated. Column dependencies or mutual information or Pearson's correlation. Um, just identify what influences what. And that's dead simple. Recommendation. Everybody knows this because they watch Netflix, right? And Netflix does this at a massive scale. Okay. Um, so you make it really simple. You make it point and click. You drag and drop your stuff. And it shows you your data, and it shows you what your data looks like, and it gives you a picture uh, instead of um, some code or some output on a command line. I know some people like that. But um, it'll tell you, you know, how good, are the, what's the quality of these recommendations? How relevant are these recommendations? How confident am I in the relevancy of those recommendations? You've got two slider bars here, right? User, item, rating, right? Netflix, for example. And now click the, the good the big go button or the big easy button as we say and it runs um, on a massive uh, cluster of, of computing resources out in the cloud somewhere you don't even know you don't care but you just want to um, run that on a massive data set so these are the things you have to do uh, in order to um, bring the level of data science um, to a broader audience um, get much more productivity and take it out of the esoteric and bring it kind of into the everyday right which is what we all want to do. I mean, it may be great that data scientists make lots of money right now, but we need to solve a lot more problems with a small number of people um, based on data, and we're going to have to continue to do that in the future even more so. Um, that's the skills gap. Now, the last piece of this is the, 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 the moving the computation to the data, as I talked about before. Now, this whole fact right here has spawned an entire industry, right, more or less. Um, so why, why does that matter? Why does it move the computation of the data matter? And I, I talked about it a little bit, like you can't move the data around because it's very heavy. It's, it, it costs money to move it around. You take a 10 or 100 terabytes of data, petabyte of data, move it into the cloud, it costs you a lot of money and it takes a while, right? So you have to keep the data and move the computation or move the analysis to the data. And um, the interesting thing about that is that uh, it's not always big, right? So the data starts big 
Um, but then it becomes very, very relevant. And by the time you're looking at it on a, on a dashboard, it's small, right? You're looking at 100 points or 10 points, maybe a few hundred points on a, on a visual, right? You can't look at a billion points, right? So a million points on a map is one big solid color. It doesn't tell you anything, right? You have to aggregate, as they say, the data um, in order to cook it down, if you will, into what's relevant. So first you've got to prepare it, make sure you're looking at the right thing, right? And you're cooking with the right ingredients. So you need to explore it, possibly, because you don't really know what you're looking for. You might need to do machine learning to discover something that looks like it might be interesting. And then you need to uh, cook it down into something important, like by hour, by day, by customer, by region, whatever. F summarize that. Um, what was the standard deviation or um, the, the median of that uh, over the last 10 years? And then you might need to slice that and say, okay, for this product or this uh, geography, that's what I care about. Um, and then present that, right, uh, on, a, on a nice, beautiful platter, which is a, what we call it an infographic or a dashboard. And as we get down that, that pipeline, the data becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's not just one step. It's not just like, give me an answer, right? So it's not like, you give me an answer, and then it just comes back. You have to go through this multiple different steps. That's what we call a, a pipeline or a funnel. And um, when we're doing this funnel, there's kind of a natural divide. There's like the techies who know what the machine data means, right, and know what error code 405 means. And they are more power users. They're, they're, they're uh, more sophisticated users. There's less change to that process. Error code 405 usually means the same thing, right? They're not these uh, fickle business people always asking different questions, pesky questions of the IT people. They're more planned and scheduled um, uh, analytics uh, pipelines, as we call them, right? Um, we know how to clean the data. We know how we need to aggregate it. Sometimes it changes. We need to make it easy, but um, there tend to be even more. There tend to be, tends to be more change at the bottom of the funnel. Less trained users, like the Excel users, just give me the spreadsheet so I can put a filter in, get my answer, and go on and keep selling. And uh, and there's both high and low value questions. People ask more the more profound questions here, the more basic questions here. A lot of times, and the problem with um, big data platforms initially was that um, they didn't have an architecture that worked well uh, for the entire uh, pipeline of working with big data. And so what you typically did was you had a hybrid approach. You have a big data platform, like our technology that we use is called Hadoop, and it was really like a freight train, right? So it takes a long time to get going, but it can move a lot of data over a long period of time for a low cost, right? It's efficient at scale. It's not good for a small data, right? If you need to go to the uh, around the corner to get a glass, a, a bottle of milk. It's not you want to take a bicycle. You don't want to take a freight train. It seems kind of inefficient, right? Um, but if you need to move, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons, you want a freight train. And the other approach was to use a database, a traditional database, or what are called in-memory uh, analytics tools, where they, they take all the data and load it into the RAM of your computer, and then they make it available for analysis. And there's a lot of companies that have technologies like that. And the problem with those technologies, of course, is they couldn't hold as much data. So a lot cheaper to keep your data on some hard drives than it is to keep it in your, in your system memory. And think about your SSD on your Mac uh, versus uh, how much memory you have on your Mac. There's a big difference there. Um, and so that was a problem. And so um, when you don't keep all your data in one place and you have this hybrid approach where you need both technologies for various reasons, you end up with a situation in which maybe you use a database or a data warehouse, or maybe you use Hadoop, and you bring in all these different types of data, this machine data and whatnot, and you have the real smart guys, the geeks, the guys with the glasses, doing the data preparation and the integration and knowing what error code 405 looks like, and a slew of open source tools. If you ever use Hadoop, it sounds like a zoo. You get a pig and a hive and a flume and a scoop and a zookeeper. Those are all technologies that are part of Hadoop. Didn't make that up. And then you use uh, some framework for executing your, your analysis, for computing what you want to compute. MapReduce, Spark, you may have heard about that, invented here at Berkeley, right across the road, um, SQL, right? Um, you need to query your data. And then the data administrators say, okay, um, so we have all this data that's ready, but you, Mr. Business Guy, don't know how to use this environment because you don't have glasses, right? So <laughs> to, to, to be able to use the environment, we need to first move it over to another environment that re doesn't require glasses, and that's um, a, a process called cubing or aggregation of data. Uh, the data administrator will control when some of this data is going to flow over here, and then people without glasses can um, actually, um, I'm not going to jail for that, am I? Are going to be uh, able to use it, right? And uh, not data scientists, right? And so this technology will typically be the right-hand side of the other screen, which was the in-memory or the traditional database, the oracles of the world, the MySQL, the Postgres, 
those databases. And then they'll have a tool for visualizing the data. Um, and and they, they speak the language of the business. They want to know about churn and um, conversion and cross-sell, upsell and you know, campaigns and attribution and things like that. And they'll work on a small subset of the data because that's all that can fit into this environment. So you've got two copies of the data. What if you need some data over here that this guy didn't know about? Again, you're kind of doing a factory approach where he has to go build the data set for you that you want. You can't do it in what we call a self-service way because you've got to go back and ask him to do it for you, right? So that doesn't facilitate this very quick sort of cycle that we talked about before. Uh, better than you know the, the really traditional approach I talked about with uh, predictive analytics, but still there's a, st there's a stop in there. Whenever there's a gap and you have to talk to somebody else, it slows you down. And so you need a hybrid car. You need a system that can work at the large scale of data that people have today, but also be performant and efficient at the small scale. So when you slam on the gas, you need the gasoline engine. But when you get up to speed, it's both more efficient, cheaper, and just as fast, if not faster, to use an electric motor, right? So you need that hybrid automatically sort of switching car to drive you down all the way down the road. And that's what um, some technology that, that, that we have recently introduced into our product. And, and the, the whole idea is to let it solve for all cases, not require you to move the data somewhere else to finish the job. And then you have one, uh, one environment, one place where everyone can party on the data. You know, the administrators, the geeks, the business analysts, whoever it is, and you have this intelligent uh, hybrid car that switches back and forth and uses the right technology for the right piece of the problem without you knowing. You're just like in Excel doing your pivot table. And it's like, oh, this part of the pivot table will be faster in memory, right? And it just does it for you. Now, so that fact, right, <laughs> that architectural problem um, and the fact that you need to put all your data in one place, as it becomes bigger, it gets over the size in which it becomes feasible to all the time copy it around. And there's a certain threshold there. So that fact and the fact of these hybrid architectures and the problem with that has spawned a huge uh, sort of sub-industry in, in, in enterprise software. And uh, some might call it a bubble. You guys decide, the economics guys. Uh, couldn't get a number from 2014, but 3.6 billion of venture capital went into big data in just 2013 alone, so big data companies. And the 2014 projection um, was updated in 2014 is that the market opportunity for big data is, will be $50 billion uh, by 2017. So this is a net new market that's being created because there's a technology shift, there's a sea change, and it's $50 billion. Venture capitalists love that, right? So they start investing, they start investing heavily, right? And what do they invest into? They invest into infrastructure. They invest into Hadoop, NoSQL, the platform layer, kind of the substrate, right? Companies including Cloudera, Hortonworks, Datastax, MongoDB, very fast growing venture backed companies. Um, one of them IPO'd uh, last fall, uh, Hortonworks. Cloudera received a um, over $700 million investment from Intel Capital the biggest investment in the history of Intel Capital, right? Intel's going after this because, or at least we presume, the PC market isn't as profitable anymore. Now they go after the data center, the business sort of computing market. So they made a huge bet on that. Uh, and then public cloud infrastructure, right? Because um, as complicated as it is to do this data science stuff without good tools, it's also complicated to set up the gear. If you've been working with Oracle or MySQL your whole life, you can't easily set up Hadoop and Yarn and the whole zoo of tools I was talking about and make it reliable for a whole bunch of users to go out the data. So public cloud, let people do that for you, right? The great public clouds of the world, Amazon, Google, and now Microsoft really coming in and, and challenging them, or competing with them at least, right? They offer infrastructure. So you rent Hadoop by the hour, right? Based on how much data you, you want, right? Or you rent the, the servers, right? You, you know, what startup in the Valley or in San Francisco isn't powered by Amazon in the back end these days. It's hard to find one, right? Um, and then you have Haas, right? So this was the other title of the talk. Haas stands for, anyone want to guess? Yes, Hadoop as a service, sorry. Uh, Hadoop as a service. So Hadoop as a service is an instance of what we call platform as a service, which means it's not just infrastructure. It's not an application. It's not something that's like ready to eat, right? It's not just ingredients. It's kind of like a pizza crust, right? It's like halfway made, right? It's a platform that you can use quickly to get a meal, right? And that's um, what Hadoop as a Service is, right? So Hadoop as a Service is this middle layer uh, that is now being 
created um, as a category of software. Um, and so there are companies founded uh, and funded in the last couple of years, very recently, uh, like AltaScale and Qbowl, um, and they provide really, they call it Hadoop dial tone, right? Like you pick up the phone, and there's always a dial tone. There's always Hadoop available, and you can store and process so much data, and they'll take care of it if something goes wrong uh, with, um, with the, the network, right? Um, and then Amazon has had a product actually for a really long time, which is more of a kind of a grassroots consumer-y developer-driven thing, where it's like, I know exactly what I want. I need some Hadoop. I'm going to go and rent it by the hour. Uh, and Alta Scale and, and the others are more like, I'm a big company and I want to support my, Hadoop, my analytical needs for the next two years. Can you consult with me about this? And, and we'll come to a deal. Um, so there's been a barrier to entry until now um, to get into the Hadoop space, which is that, again, esoteric skill set for doing the data science and also for just setting up the gear, being the system administrator, right? The infrastructure piece of it. And there's a cost barrier too. Like, I got this system and it might print me money and it might answer these incredible foundational questions, but I don't know yet. And so how much should I invest in that when I'm not completely sure, right? So people, you know, they felt like they're getting married to the technology, you know, with millions of dollars um, just before they could even ask their first question. That's not a good business model, right? So um, the barrier to entry was, was high, maybe $200,000 for a reasonable setup of 50 terabytes. Um, this is still a lot lower than the uh, bank I talked to who was paying $500,000 uh, for one terabyte in their legacy environment five years ago. You can go out and buy you know, a terabyte for 100 bucks at Best Buy. You can go out and buy Hadoop um, uh, for less than $1,000 a terabyte and put it in your data center, right? So think about the difference there. Like the price is coming down, I'll talk about that. Um, why do we do this? Because, again, the cost to entry was too high and the time to deploy uh, was also too high. So the, the speed at which you could um, deploy. So if you're a gaming company or you're um, Facebook or you're, you know, it wasn't available at Facebook's time, but if you're, you know, Tinder, right? You're a company that's growing at incredible pace, right? You're acquiring users like nuts. Uh, you're getting so much data, your data is doubling every few months or whatever, and you see it going up like this. You need um, the this, this cost to scale equation to work out. You need linear cost to scale, because if it goes exponential, you're out of money, right? You can't, you're, you'll be over your budget. So you've got to be able to predict when you scale up to 100x or 1000x the data volume you have, the costs are going to be reasonable for your budget, right? And that's what uh, Hadoop allows you to do, but you can also like get deployed in days as opposed to three months to build out this, this data center gear. And so what this also does is this um, deployment of all this technology and people wanting to make it easier starts to build um, a stack of not just plumbing, but applications, right? Smart meter analytics, right? It's an application that PG&E uses. You go and check your bill compared to your neighbor. The most motivating thing to people to lower their energy consumption is to see that their neighbor is doing better than they are. So uh, there's a company called Opower that takes Hadoop technology and bakes it into their environment and sells it to PG&E and lots of other uh, utilities, Con Edison and so forth, Southern um, California Edison, and they kind of gamified the whole thing. It's like basically this is how you compare to the top 10 people on your block or your block in total, right? And man, that gets people to lower their energy. They don't want to be the worst guy on the block. So uh, applications are emerging on top of this uh, plumbing, on top of this uh, ecosystem of technology. This is the zoo of different open source tools I talked about, the, the, this, um, the pig and all that, and the hive, and the zookeeper. Uh, and then there's um, different classes of applications that can be built with um, these different uh, frameworks, if you will. These are just the building blocks on a massively, um, what we call distributed, many machines storage system, it looks like your, your file system on your, your machine, and then an operating system that you can run different applications at the same time, right? But it's, run, it's spread over hundreds of servers or thousands of servers. Yahoo has 35,000 or 45,000 probably at this point uh, machines that make up this one system. So they're deploying apps, but those apps are actually running across uh, a grid of 35,000 different computers that are all operating in concert together, right? A lot of other companies in the thousands. And it opens up the opportunity for ISVs, or we call independent software vendors, people that build applications that are ready-made to, to sit on top of that infrastructure. We stand on the shoulders of that stack. Berkeley has its own stack too, the Berkeley Big Data Analytics stack. Uh, everyone has a stack these days. Um, 
And we were one of those application vendors, right? So the enabling technology uh, opens the door for new uh, companies to come in and build on top of that and get to market quickly with something that provides immediate value to the customer rather than build all the way from the bottom up. So um, this doesn't work so well for the existing guys who are using the old technology. Not so good for them, right? So we have a nice little company here uh, with six and a half billion dollars in market cap um, called Teradata. And that is their stock chart over the last five years. You may notice that it does not follow the macroeconomic trend. <laughs> in fact, quite uh, distinctly does not. It's kind of the other direction, right? And notice that 2002 is kind of the year where Hadoop really took off is the point where it starts to look not so good, right? And so what's happening here is that they built a business based on a very high uh, unit cost, based on a lot of control over a closed platform for a very small set of high-end customers, the Walmarts of the world, right? Who only a certain number of customers had this problem and they could afford to pay extreme prices. But then once a lot of other companies started to hit this problem, they were like, there's no way I can pay that. So they went around and they started using what Google and Facebook and Yahoo were using, which is Hadoop, right? And they're like, it's kind of hard to use. And some other company came in and said, okay, we'll make it easier, right? We'll provide support and we'll polish it up and we'll make it easier for you to, to consume as an IT organization. And then this just started accelerating, right? And accelerating, accelerating is like, as, P as um, one of these companies would say, I think they're gonna talk to you later, Cloudera, uh, you know, they, the web companies, the eBay and, and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and Yahoo and Google of the world kind of saw the future, right? They, they were just out ahead of um, the banks and the insurance companies and the uh, airlines and uh, the retailers and so on. But everybody's gonna hit this wall where exponential price like doesn't work anymore. And so that is what is causing this sea change move from traditional data infrastructure and tools to a whole new stack. And um, as uh, one of the top guys at Microsoft, and is also at a company called Pivotal right now, has a great quote and he says that history teaches us when the data fabric change, changes, uh, everything else changes along with it, right? The way the data is stored and organized and the, the way you access that data, when that changes, all of the plumbing and applications on top of that have to move with it. And so that opens the space in the market for companies to compete and not um, have a stock chart that you can sled down. <laughs> okay, so um, in summary, um, make things simple. Simple always wins. Questions? Um, can you give us a few examples of some of your clients and the types of problems they've solved with your software? Uh, yes, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Whatever you're allowed to share. Yeah, um, sure. So, uh, okay, a really interesting one is um, uh, a retirement services company that sell mutual funds, right? To actually people that work in higher education, be able to figure out who it is. Um, and they were trying to figure out why are people moving their money out of the funds? Like when do we lose customers? Because it just happens and they were sort of looking in the rearview mirror and they're trying to prevent that. And so they would look at a number of different indicators and see where there's a pattern. So they would see that someone called into the call center and when they called, they had their financial advisor on the line, right, with them. Interesting, they're about to make some important financial decision. And they would log that in their call center. They would have, uh, look at the web, web traffic on their website, and then you go to your portfolio, and then you go to the terms and conditions page, right? And what are the terms and conditions? When you hit that page, you might be interested in something like moving your money out, right? Um, and when you um, change jobs, when you move out of state, right? When you retire, obviously. Like, you can keep your, a lot of times you can keep your money or you can roll it over, right? So they would look at all these things as well as, um, the buying and selling activity, the transferring activity between the funds within their account, and they would devise a concrete list of paths that people would take to move money out. And they weren't necessarily looking at the number of people, they're looking at the flow of money total. And they're like, these are the important paths that lead to a high flow out. These are the people who have who've done all this sequence of activities in that order that we're gonna go and call to try to prevent that, right? So knowing a customer really, really well. It's called like customer intelligence or understanding the customer journey. There's a lot of people doing that. Another um, interesting one in um, telco, as it comes to mind, is uh, a big telco company in Europe. They were merging with a lot of other smaller telcos 
And they were trying to understand, okay, when we merge with this company and we plan next year's upgrades to go from 3G to 4G to LTE, we've got to update every cell tower. Like, what do we, what do we update? Previously, um, the data was in different places. So the network team would say, this base station, this uh, cell tower is at 85% capacity. And when these people come on, it's going to be at 100. We're going to lose people, right? And the question that was never asked was, well, who are those people? Like, how valuable are they to us? What's the total revenue for all those people who live in that zip code, right? And uh, how should we make our decision based on that? How should we do our capacity planning? In other words, our hundreds of millions of dollars in um, capital to upgrade our network based on the customer value of that particular segment. And so they'd run this through this big data system with Datamere and, and they'd come out with a list of these are all the upgrades we should make and these are all the service requests when there's a problem that we should go and uh, deal with first because those people are spending 200 a month and this guy's got you know prepaid $30 a month, right? So making those de decisions with business context, not just the, uh, the technical information that was previously used. Um, I'll let, let someone else ask another question before I keep rambling on. One more? Chris. Okay, so I was just curious, like, I'm probably not going to become a data scientist. I don't know if I have that kind of skill set. But if we're planning like, to work with some, what are some of the areas of focus that you would recommend for us to look at? If you want to work with big data? or Yeah, if we're, like, we're going to be on the same team at some point or... Um, so more or less every reasonable sized company at this stage has some kind of a big data initiative, right? The CIOs, I think it's sometime maybe 2013, started deciding that if they went to the CIO retreat and were the only guy who didn't have a big data project, they'd look like an idiot. And so they made sure that every company had a big data initiative within their IT organization. And so every big company you go to, well, you gotta search for it sometimes, but the people who are doing you know, like fraud and risk at a bank and, you know, prediction, right? Those kinds of things. Um, the people that are, even marketing folks that are worried about acquisition, churn, upsell, cross sell, those kind of things. Uh, in the consumer space where there's a lot of data and it's a, the interaction with the customer is digital. Um, all kinds of big companies will have some practice around uh, using big data and our technology specifically is, is Hadoop. I think Hadoop is kind of the, the early winner in the, in the, in the big data plumbing. So that's a word you would look for. Um, but uh, if you want to be on the customer side, right, as a user, I mean, <laughs> any company whose business is very data driven, right? So I would think about it that way. People that are intermediaries, people whose product is really heavily correlated around data, or people that have a consumer business where there's a lot of customers and those customers generate a lot of information and when they interact with the company, they're going to have a big data um, environment and a big data practice of some kind. Um, but think about the, the really hardcore users, like the, the heaviest users of big data are the, the, the Google, um, you know, the Facebook, the Yahoo, right? Because, um, I mean, Facebook is just a, a gold mine of a data set, right? And, uh, and, a, and a machine um, uh, that's uh, driven largely by data. I, mean, I think the question was, as, a, as an MBA, right, as somebody who's not a data scientist, um, what, what do they need to know in order to work effectively with the, the data scientists? Because, um, you know, you've talked about how, you know, you can try to bypass some mm -hmm. data scientists at some level, and you are ultimately going to require some data scientists in your, your team. So what kind of, of non-data scientists uh, learn that, that will help them to you know, work better with the data scientists? So I would say, um, Definitely get to know your data scientist, um, and but I, I, I think I think actually that this is a um, historical blip on the on the evolution of, of big data that um, only PhDs and statisticians are, are, are working with big data, right? Because as I mentioned, almost every large company has large volumes of data, and they want to look at unstructured data, and they want to do they want to be able to really well know their customers, right? Which requires this kind of analysis. Um, and so I think that, that the, the tools are going to look a lot simpler in the future. And so if you know Excel, right, and you know basic stats, and you understand and are comfortable working with, um, working with lots of data, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard to put it to pinpoint, but I think that um, uh, you, know, you can either be a data scientist or you can take the output of what a data scientist does and apply your, your knowledge to that, right, and use their model, right? Or you can use a simpler tool to ask the more basic questions um, that don't require the statistic knowledge or the, the, the algorithmic knowledge that uh, data science tools do. 
I just think it's going to be like almost every department is going to be using big data in a big company. I mean, marketing is a data, big data driven discipline now, right? It wasn't the case 10 years ago. Well, great. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.